Romans chapter 1, the 18th verse. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew him as God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made with corruptible, of, made like corruptible man <clears throat> and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever, amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the women <clears throat> burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, they are whisperers or gossips, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Wrath of God is a forgotten, and may I say almost a forbidden doctrine, even in so-called Bible-believing evangelical churches today. I would venture that there are many here today that have never once heard a sermon preached on the wrath of God from a biblical standpoint. Now let me say that sadly there are some preachers today who scream and holler and spit and bluster on and on about the wrath of God but don't really tie it to the biblical truth. It's just a list of their own laundry list of sins that they hate. But it's a neglected doctrine, and the reason for this apparent neglect are not hard to find. Uh, let's face it, most of us would rather not hear a sermon on God's wrath. We'd rather hear a sermon about his love and grace. I would rather preach a sermon to you about God's love and grace. I'd rather not preach about God's wrath. He, as one great preacher said, was when you preach on the wrath of God, you do it with a tear in your eye. It is certainly an integral part of what the Bible calls the full counsel of God. And if we are to consider all the attributes of God, we must consider his wrath. Many Christians feel that they have to apologize for this doctrine. Some think it's a, a blemish on God's character. Others think that God's wrath is inconsistent with his character or with his love. And there's no way that these things can be brought to harmonize. So they say that the Old Testament God was different from the New Testament God. Well, we're gonna be mostly in the New Testament today. 
I don't know of any other more vivid demonstration of God's wrath than the death on the cross of Jesus Christ. No need for us to apologize for God's word as long as it's fairly and graciously taught. J.I. Packer said that the fact that the subject of divine wrath has become so taboo in modern society and that Christians by and large have accepted the taboo and conditioned themselves never to raise the matter. The Bible says more and there are more references to the wrath of God than there are to the love of God. That's just a fact. We also know that Jesus in his earthly ministry spoke more about hell than he did about heaven. James Montgomery Boyce, the great Presbyterian preacher, said that today's preaching is deficient at many points, but there is no point at which it is more evidently inadequate and even explicitly contrary to the word of God than in its neglect of the wrath of God. So we're going to preach on the wrath of God today. It was hard to find songs to sing that go along with the wrath of God. The wrath of God was satisfied, that comes to mind. But other than that, boy, that was tough. It's a subject that's not easy to preach on talk about. What is the meaning, number one, the meaning of God's wrath? God's wrath is his settled righteous hostility towards sin in all of its various manifestations. God's wrath is God's resolute meaningful action to punish sin. It is the righteous execution of his perfect, perfect justice. It is not uncontrolled rage. It is not vindictive bitterness. It is not God blowing his top or losing his temper. It is, again, God's resolute action to punish sin and the righteous execution of his perfect justice. Let me talk about this for just a second. Have you, we all surf the internet and play games, look at YouTube and things like this, right? Have you seen these videos that they're usually titled Instant Karma? Now don't confuse karma with anything biblical because it's not, but um, you know, the, the issue of a guy who, uh, you know, they, they show him taking a lady's purse off of her shopping cart, walking out of the store and as he does, a uh, uh, garbage truck runs through and, and knocks him over and, you know, just about kills him or something. A lot of those kind of goofy videos going around where, you know, somebody, quote unquote, gets theirs, right, instantaneously. They call it instant karma. The Bible talks about God's wrath as something I believe that is quite glorious. Uh, two places in the book of Revelation in chapter 14 and again in chapter 18, it talks about the fall of Babylon and how the people of the earth rejoice when they see Babylon fallen. Um, Psalm 9 and verse 17 says that they shall be turned into hell with all the nations that forgot God. Think of it. Think of all the people that are getting away with it, it would seem today. The abortionists and the child molesters and, and the false preachers suddenly being brought face to face with the righteous, perfect, all-seeing judgment of God. A.W. Pink said the wrath of God is his eternal detestation detestation of all unrighteousness. It is his displeasure and indignation, of divine equity against all evil. It is the holiness of God stirred into action against sin. God is angry against sin because it is rebellion against his authority and a wrong done to his inviolable sovereignty. Don't you wish 
like so many of us do, that God would suddenly step in and bring judgment upon the wicked. Now, we're not... Be careful with that. We said that God's wrath is not vindictive, and it's not. It's righteous. All too often, we want God to get those who have wronged us, and all the while, we want mercy for all the things that we've done and gotten away with seemingly. God's anger is not malignant nor malicious retaliation, inflicting injury for the sake of it, or in return for injury received. No, through God, I'm sorry, though God will vindicate his dominion as governor of the universe, he will not be vindictive. Again, A.W. Pink. Nehemiah 9 and verse 17 says, Thou art God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness. And he forsook them not. Psalm 103 and verse 8 says, similarly says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. Wrath, when it comes, can be seen as holiness meeting sin. Wrath is what happens when justice meets rebellion, when righteousness meets unrighteousness, when the perfect good meets pure rebellion and evil. As long as God is God, he cannot, he will not overlook sin or stand indifferently by while it destroys his people and his creation or when men trample his will or mock his holy name. God does not tolerate sin. Let's talk about the, the revelation of God's wrath. We looked at the meaning of God's wrath Look at our text. Romans 1 and verse 18 says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. There's a progression here that takes place. We see it in the text. Number one, the truth of God is suppressed. The truth of God is suppressed. Is that happening in our society today? Is God's truth being suppressed? Redefined? Prohibited in the public arena? Prohibited in classrooms? One of our major political parties voted to remove any reference to God from their platform. They'll be turned into hell and all the nations that forgot God. Number two, that suppression of truth leads to ungodliness. Ungodly living, ungodly behavior, character. Ungodliness leads to pure wickedness. Wickedness. And wickedness, letter D, leads to every kind of evil and violence. I've told you about an experience we had in a local church several years ago now. The ultimate cause of which was the fact that the people did not want to hear God's word. They suppressed God's word. They, they didn't want to believe it. They, they said repeatedly, I know the Bible says, but they went so far as to make ask me if I would promise, these were the people that wanted me to stay rather than leave, asked me if I would promise not to preach certain parts of the Bible. They didn't believe the Bible. That's their problem. And it resulted in ungodly behavior and finally in wickedness and every kind of lying, slanderous, vindictive, wicked behavior. Paul here is teaching that the moral perversion follows doctrinal perversion. What you believe will be how you will live. Errant doctrine leads to errant living. Always, there are no exceptions. 
Left to ourselves, we will turn to wickedness. We will turn to our own ways, as Isaiah 53, 6 says, without the regulating principle of God's truth. Men, due to our own sin nature, lust for sin. Therefore, we suppress the truth that we know so as to make it fit into our sinful lifestyles. Rather than conforming our lives to God's will and his ways, we twist and contort the Bible to make it fit our desires and our preferences. Number three, the result of God's wrath. We see again a sequence here. A sequence. Note the progression. Number one, indifference to God. Indifference to God. Verse 21. Because although they knew him, they did not glorify him as God, neither were they thankful. Indifference to God. When they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were they thankful. You see, there are many, many nice, quote unquote, good people in the world your neighbors, your friends, and perhaps your family. And we think, boy, they'd make a good Christian if they would just get saved. The fact of the matter is they're indifferent to God. That is followed by a moral blindness. Romans 1, verse 21 and 22. Their foolish hearts were darkened. They became vain in their imaginations. Their foolish heart was darkened, and professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. They became fools. A fool has said in his heart, there is no God. A fool is one who ignores God, is indifferent to God, and then, as a result, develops a moral blindness. Vain imaginations. Uh, another translation is futile thinking. Futile thinking. If you want to see it, turn on The View. Or turn on an old Phil Donahue show. Or Oprah Winfrey show. Or just read your newspaper. Watch, watch the news. Having rejected God's truth, they try to find something to replace it, i.e. religion. It's like riding on a seesaw. If one is up, the other is down. If God is up, man is down. But when man is up, reality is distorted and nothing is right. Man suppresses God and places himself over God. You hear it this way. I would not worship a God like that. Oh, really? So you are putting yourself on the judgment throne and judging whether you approve or disapprove of God. Aren't you, don't you see that you're claiming yourself to be God? Number three, we suffer the loss of God. Now, God is still there, right? Verse 23 says, they exchange the glory of of the incorruptible God. Exchange, that's an interesting word. It's an interesting word. Uh, think of exchanged in the context of the day after Christmas. What do you do? You take your presents back and exchange them. You take the things that you don't want and exchange them for the things that you would have wanted. We exchange God for something else that then becomes God in our lives. Whatever we worship, whomever we serve, or place above God is, in fact, your God. Which then, of course, leads to the most common sin in the Bible, idolatry. Idolatry. Romans 1 and 23, they changed the image of the, the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Again, it doesn't have to be a physical carved-out image. It's whatever we 
profess and project God to be in our mind. That's why the commandment, don't make any graven images, because you can't possibly make anything that would match the glory of God. In fact, what we do is we create a God in our own image. When man walks away from God, he begins to worship himself, and then continues in a downward spiral. We exchange God. We don't abandon God. Why? Because we were created to worship. It is necessary for us, it is natural for us to worship. And so if we don't worship the God of the Bible, we don't just not worship, we find something else to worship. It's as I believe it was Pascal said, in every man there's a God-shaped hole. And when we don't put God there, we try to find other things to fill it up. By the way, Pascal said that God-shaped void that only Jesus Christ can fill. We trade God for something that we want instead of him. Or, better yet, cash. We all want money, right? The sequence, indifference to God, moral blindness, the loss of God, and then idolatry. Now look at the consequence. Notice it says, God gave them up. God gave them up in verse 24. He gave them up to the uncleanness of the lusts of their hearts. Sexual immor immorality. Now we're not talking here about believers. We're, we're assured in God's word in John chapter 6 and verse 37 and Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5. I will never leave you nor will I forsake you. God will never give us up as to our salvation. John chapter 6, verse 37. This is quite plainly. Father has testified, uh, I'm sorry, verse 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will in no means cast out. Hebrews 13 and verse 5 says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. God will not leave a believer. Sometimes he lets us go and reap the rewards of our own sinfulness and rebellion just as the prodigal son. But remember, he was still a son. The Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 9, God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by the Lord Jesus Christ. But God will give those who are lost over to their own sinful ways. You see, sin, I've said this many times, sin comes with its own built-in punishment, right? God doesn't need to do anything. He just lets us go and do what we want. He lets us have what we want. And that's where the judgment is. Number one leads to sexual immorality, verses 24 and 25. God gave them up to uncleanness, through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. I said the lie. That's literally what it says. What is the lie? What is the lie? When you're reading the Bible, the lie, what's the lie? You can be like God. You're not going to die. You can figure out good and evil from your, for yourself. What the lie that Satan told Eve back in the garden? God gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts. In other words, to let them have what they want, to dishonor their bodies between themselves. They changed the truth of God into the lie. I don't need God to tell me what to do. I can figure it out myself. I'm not going to die. I'm going to be like God. And they worship and serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Number one, sexual immorality. Number two, homosexuality. Immorality always leads to perversion and deviant behavior, the redefining of sin, the, the, the downward spiral into depravity. Verse 26, for this cause God gave them up to vile affections. 
For even the women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust to one another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, receiving in themselves the recompense of their error, which was fitting. Fitting means proper and appropriate. leads to number three, total moral depravity. Verse 28. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind, a debased mind. To do the things which are not fitting, not appropriate, not convenient. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceitful, evil-mindedness, they're whisperers, gossips, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. Wow, that doesn't seem like a big deal and with all these others, is it? Yes, it is. It's rebellion. The Bible says rebellion is just as the sin of witchcraft. Undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, and unmerciful. Who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also prove those who practice them. Notice judgment comes even to those who approve these deeds. The courts today... Accepting, approving, endorsing deviancy. People say, but then why aren't we being judged? Why aren't we under God's judgment? People, don't you realize these are the judgments of God? When God takes his hand off of us and lets us go our own way, that is judgment. You know, I heard something interesting this week about the nation of China. China is the largest country in the world with the biggest army in the world. And I heard that today because of their one child policy, which has been lifted by the way, now they have a three child policy, but the fact of the matter is women don't wanna get married and have children. And you have to be married in order to have a birthing license in China. So uh, if you're a single woman, they pretty much always have abortions because only married people are allowed to have children in China. So, and, and, and women don't want to be married. So they don't get married. So they don't have children. So in 50 years, the popula population of China, in 50 years, the population of China will be 50% of what it is today. In 50 years, the population of China will be 50% of what it is today. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine? Just look at what's done in our country. The, the economic turmoil that's come because we don't have enough people to pay the bills of the people that are retiring and all that. It's going to be chaos. It's going to be chaos. God's judgment on sin is generally not the fire and brimstone sort, but when God comes to judge a community or a nation, he simply lets them follow their own sinful choices. He gives them over to their natural end. We must realize that because we're not experiencing God's burning wrath, it does not mean that we're not under his judgment. Isaiah 53 and verse six says, all we like sheep have gone astray and turned everyone to our own way. So we read in chapter two and verse five, because of the stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you store up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Wow. So far we haven't talked a lot about hope. But there is hope. 
We've been studying in Sunday school, First Thessalonians chapter, First uh, Thessalonians chapter one. Paul writes Silvanus and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love, your patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and the Father. Knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction, with joy in the Holy Spirit, so that all of you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Jesus delivers us from the wrath to come. Look at verse 9. You turn to God from the idols to serve the living and true God. Wait for Jesus, his son, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Let's talk about deliverance from God's wrath in just these final minutes. Well, because Jesus died, God's justice has been satisfied. His wrath has been appeased. Till on the cross where Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid. Here in the blood of Christ I stand. 1 John 2 and verse 2. He is the propitiation, the satisfaction for our sins. And not ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. By offering his own blood, Jesus did what the blood of bulls and goats could never do. He satisfied once and for all God's requirement and turned away his fierce wrath. The penalty for our sin has been paid in full. Letter B, because Jesus received God's wrath, we and receive his mercy. God's mercy is available for those who call on the name of the Lord. The Bible says in John, uh, sorry, James 2 and verse 13, mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Letter C, this is the part we need to understand. Because you may be here today and saying, you know, I... It sounds good. I'd like to think about it. I'm not there yet, but I'm thinking about following Christ and trusting in him. Well, the Bible says in John 3 and verse 16, God so loved the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Too many people stop there, though. Verse 17 says, God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believes on him is not condemned, but he that believes not is already condemned because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. You see, we are currently under condemnation unless you are in Christ. Unless you are in Christ, you are under condemnation. The Bible says in verse 36, He that believes in the Son has everlasting life, but he that believes not in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God is abiding on him at present. And again, it's not that you're going to be struck by fire falling from the sky. 
You're not going to be struck by a bolt of lightning. The earth isn't going to open up and swallow you up alive. Probably. It is that you are at enmity with the holy God. You are his enemy. Unless you repent. The problem is, it says in verse 19, this is the judgment that light has come and men preferred the darkness because their deeds are evil. So they turned to their own ways. They rejected God. They refused God. And so God's wrath will be poured out on them. Let me ask you this. Have you been to the cross? Have you received God's grace? Years ago, in this part of the country, when the settlers were coming across the prairies, they had a great fear. That fear was during the dry season, they feared the prairie fires. Prairie fires would start by some, you know, campfire, some spark, some someone putting out a, a cigarette or a, a pipe or whatever, throwing away a match on the dry grass. And it would spread and it would spread. And the winds, you know how the winds are around here in the spring, they would sweep up and, and just spread that fire everywhere. And it would spread and it would spread and and it would be coming over the horizon and the people wouldn't have anywhere to go and it would skip over streams and rivers. I mean, the wind was that strong that it would blow embers across over the rivers and, and there was no place to run and no place to hide. And so the people invented a way of defensing against the prairie fires. They would light a fire and burn out a large field, a large patch of ground and they would go to that place where the fire had already been. And they'd be safe because when the fire came, it would go around them and it wouldn't burn them. God's wrath is coming for sure. It's coming for sure. And there will be no place to run and no place to hide except the one and only place where his wrath has already been poured out on the earth, and that is at the cross of Jesus Christ. Are you safe in the cross? Have you been to the cross? The Bible says in Isaiah 53, 6, all we like sheep have gone astray and turned everyone to our own way, and he, God, has laid on him, Jesus Christ, the iniquity of us all. And so he has become the propitiation, the payment for our sins. And not ours only, but of the whole world. Jews, Gentiles alike. Have you been to the cross to receive God's mercy? Are you living under the grace of God? Are you living in a relationship with Jesus Christ, knowing that your sins are completely forgiven? Do you have that assurance of eternal life? Simply put, are you living under the shadow of the cross or under a dark cloud of God's holy and righteous wrath? See, there's no need for us to apologize for God's word as long as it's fairly and graciously presented. After all, if we fail to understand God's hatred of sin, how can we ever understand and appreciate his mercy and his amazing, amazing grace? Have you been to the cross? Let's pray.